comes from the Gospel of Luke and can be found on page 1045 of your Pew Bibles. It's Luke chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. Hear these words. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint am I under until it is completed? The word of God for the people of God. Thank you very much, Pastor Mark. I have a message for us today entitled, The Fire Doors of the Soul. Before I get to that, I want to reiterate what you heard earlier. Next Sunday is Back to School Sunday, and we're going to have supplies for kids and a special prayer time for our children, for our teachers, for our administration officials. And it'll be a special themed Sunday for Back to School. So if you you have friends or family or people you know that are involved in the school system, we invite you to encourage them to participate so that we might pray with them and believe with them for a great new year as we begin a new school year. A lot to look forward to, and we want to make the most of it by starting the year off right. All right, fire doors of the soul, may we pray. Lord, focus us now on the Bible message we heard moments ago. May those words from ancient history leap from the pages of the Bible directly into our hearts and souls and minds now, where we might apply them in our day-to-day living. May we glean something today that truly helps us today and in the weeks to come. Our minds are alert, our heart is open, our soul is prepared. Speak to us, Lord, for we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) Fire doors are helpful things for buildings. In fact, our church has several strategically placed fire doors in our our buildings, just in case something were to happen. If a fire were to break out, it, it stops the fire from going to another part of the church, much like hatches in a submarine if there were to be some emergency, a leak or a fire or some, some catastrophic event. Doors can be sealed to cordon off, so to speak, that, that issue in one part of the submarine so it doesn't affect the rest of the craft. Often ships are equipped with that kind of um, protection as well. So in this case, we have doors that will shut automatically and that will keep fire from moving from one part of the building to the other. And in that case, it's a very positive, helpful thing. Fire doors can be very useful. But if we were to think of fire doors as something internal to our system, fire doors of the soul can be not so helpful. They can be limiting because whenever we have this this beginning nudge or experience from God and his spirit, we, we often close down. We shut down from something that is not usual to us. We, we tend to close down our experience and, and keep that little piece of what we know to ourselves so that we don't have anything perhaps new, maybe uncomfortable that we haven't experienced before. Uh, keep it from, from getting deep inside of us. In that case, the fire doors of the soul are limiting and not helpful because we don't experience everything that the Holy Spirit has to offer us. And I understand why people do that. It's because often we don't understand who the Holy Spirit is or what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we seem to just shut down any kind of experience um, that is out of the ordinary for us. Jesus was speaking about this exact subject in our scripture today. In Luke chapter 12, he expresses his purpose for being here on this earth. He says, I have come to bring fire upon the earth. And oh, how I wish it were already kindled. Oh, how how I wish it were already ignited would be another way to say it. Now, what does that mean? What is fire in this context? Often preachers will take it out of context and and interpret this as as bringing fire on the earth with destruction and, and, and oblivion, taking people out, so to speak. But if that were the case, it would be in direct contradiction of what Jesus taught just a couple of days prior to the scripture that we find ourselves reading today. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus was walking through a town with the disciples. It happened to be a a Samaritan town. And he was not received as well as he or the disciples might have 
wanted to be received. And so his followers said, Jesus, why don't you rain down fire from heaven and destroy these people? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever been so, so hurt or so insulted or, or so rejected by a group of people that you just wish they could be destroyed? Well, the disciples felt that, and they expressed that to Jesus in a moment of clarity and probably uncommon honesty. And yet Jesus responded in this way. You don't know what spirit you are of. I have not come to destroy. I have come to save. And so he's very clear about his mission. And then just several hours later, we find him talking about fire that he wants to rain down on heaven. So it's clear he's not talking about destroying people. He's not talking about blowing people up. He's instead talking about this fire of enthusiasm and energy and, and the Holy Spirit that would come and refine and renew and refresh people. And oh, how I wish, he says, it were, it were already kindled. And yet he continues, I have to go through a baptism first, of which I am at this moment constrained. We'll talk about what that means in a few minutes. So we know what fire is. Fire is this idea of, of kindling the passion for faith in the people, so that they might be refined to the point of being like Jesus and inspire other people in a, in a winsome kind of way to be like him as well. So how is this fire spread? We find uh, this same kind of description throughout the Bible, including the two disciples walking on that road to Emmaus. You know that story. It was after the crucifixion and the resurrection. And these disciples are forlorn and depressed and discouraged and defeated, they thought. And they're walking along this road to Emmaus. And someone comes alongside of them and begins talking with them. They realize later it's Jesus. And as they reflect upon it, they say, Did not our hearts burn within us as he walked with us along the way? The same kind of fire description of enthusiasm and excitement that came from Jesus because he was speaking with them and, and causing a flame to burn within them of, of, for them at the moment, unknown origin, but a fire that caused them to be so excited about their faith they could hardly contain it. Did not our hearts burn within us as he walked with us, by the way? And then in Luke chapter 3 and a couple of other locations in the gospel, we find John the Baptist in the middle of the river baptizing people. And he says this, I am baptizing you with water, but there is one coming after me uh, whom I am not even worthy to fasten his sandals, who will baptize you with fire. Isn't that an interesting way to say it? He's talking about baptizing them with so much power and so much purpose that it would transform their ordinary lives into one of meaning and purpose and passion and power. Fire that causes all of us to say, how can we be more like Jesus and how can we help other people be more like Jesus? Now, this is the book, the entire book of Acts. That's the whole purpose of that book is showing how people are new creature, new creations and new creatures in Jesus because they have been so impacted by the power of the Holy Spirit. They are transformed to become a new creation, and that's exactly I think if we were to press in to the heart of what Jesus is describing to us today, we would find exactly his purpose and his point. And that is to cause people to become new creations, new creatures in him. People that abide in him and in whom he can abide. That's what he means. And the entire book of Acts talks about how this church was formed. The church was formed through these new people who were refreshed and renewed because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the church was formed and ignited across the world. It is the birthright of every believer to have the fire of the Holy Spirit within them. But what does that mean? What does it mean to receive the power of the Holy Spirit? That's why sometimes we close down these firewalls of the soul because we don't understand and we don't want to understand it was just too mysterious. It's become too mysterious. It doesn't have to be. He is not mysterious. The Holy Spirit is not mysterious. But the experience seems to be so mysterious that we just think, well, we'll we just won't deal with that right now. And yet throughout the history of the Methodist Church, 
we find the presence of the Holy Spirit. John Wesley described, the founder of the Methodist movement, described um, his heart being strangely warmed with the fire of God's love and God's acceptance and God's grace. So throughout, our, throughout the movement known as Methodist, the Holy Spirit has been very central and very primary throughout history. But what does it mean then to be on fire Christians? We hear people say, are you an on fire Christian? Or those people are on fire Christians. And then we find ourselves comparing and contrasting and judging one another. Well, I'm closer to God because of ABC. No, no, I'm closer to God because of D, E, and F. And we some, sometimes find ourselves as believers judging one another. Well, we're obviously a better church than you because we do this or because we don't do that. And when we get involved with that kind of comparison, we find ourselves missing the point. We find ourselves in a, in a competition that must be at both times comical, but also grieving to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit, because in that case, we completely miss the point. The point, of course, is how are we being changed and regenerated and renewed and refreshed so that we might then help other people be renewed, refreshed, and reinvigorated. A cold Christian, friends, is a contradiction in terms. That's just the bottom line. A cold Christian is a contradiction in terms. The warmth that comes from us is kindled from this fire that Jesus is talking about. So he continues, but there is a baptism that I must go through upon which I am constrained. What does it mean to be constrained? It means closed down. It means tied up. It means somehow limited. Of course he was limited at that point because he was in his, in his human form here on this earth. What he knew was that after the crucifixion and the resurrection, he would arise into heaven and the Holy Spirit or the other helper, as the Bible describes the Holy Spirit, would come upon the earth. He would no longer be constrained, but Jesus could be in your heart and my heart and in someone's heart somewhere else around the globe simultaneously, unchained, unconstrained, not held back. And he continues saying, oh, how I wish the fire were kindled now. We're seeing a window, friends, into his emotion. He's being very clear and open with us about how he is feeling. He's saying, how, how long do I have to be with you folks? And he's talking to the disciples and the others around him. How, how long do I have to be with you before you finally get the point? Before you finally wise up and allow yourself to be empowered by my presence? And by this Holy Spirit I've been talking with you about for all these years. Time was getting short. And Jesus wanted to be clear that it was time for the fire to be lit. So that people would be invigorated to be everything they were created to be. And to walk forward in faith. A limited Christian is one who has not come in contact with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because once we say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Live within me. And then we say, Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our lives. All of a sudden, we, we no longer have the limitations that we once had. No longer do we see ourselves as um, barely getting by with the, by the skin of our teeth, barely just somehow squeaking by. You've heard those expressions people use. Instead, we find a new energy and excitement to live life with faith and with expectation and on the tip of our toes to see what's going to happen next. And if a challenge comes, we don't back away from it. Instead, we rise up and we say, we have, we have unlimited power to defeat this challenge or to overcome this difficulty because we are not in this by ourselves. We have the power of God's Spirit living within us. And therefore, together, we can conquer any obstacle, any problem that life seems to throw at us. We fling the doors of our soul wide open. Fire doors no longer closed, no longer locked. Instead, wide open. And we say to the Holy Spirit, come in and live within me. Refine me with your fire. Renew and refresh me. Invigorate me with the excitement that I can just jump up and down. To be everything God created me to be. You and I have that power. If we will tap into it and say, Lord, I want to be a believer for you. And I want to be an excited Christian for you.
I told you earlier that a cold Christian is a contradiction in terms, which is true. A lifeless, boring Christian is also a contradiction in terms. We should instead be joyful and hopeful, empowered people to be everything that God made us to be. Not cowering back in the corner over some issue or problem that we may face, and we can all fill in the blank about whatever it might be for us any given day, and it could change from day to day or week to week. We know that. But instead of cowering in the corner, shaking in our boots, we rise to the occasion and we say, in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome. And we will overcome. I encourage all of us this morning, here and those who are listening and watching, to take a moment internally and externally to think and to say, I open the doors volitionally, on purpose, of my soul. I release the fire doors, and I say, Holy Spirit, come. Live within me. Empower me now. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for reminding us that in life, times can be challenging and times can be difficult. And yet we hear your words echo from centuries and centuries ago. I have come to bring fire upon the earth, and oh, how I wish it were already kindled. Lord, we too join you in wishing we would be kindled and ignited for you. With a warm flame of your power and your presence. Healing past emotions. Allowing a refinement and a renewal hurts and pains and mistakes. And then a refreshment to say, I can do better. I can be more than I currently am because of the power of God's spirit alive and well deep within me. We hear your longing that you wish the fire were kindled. We join you in that longing and we ask you now, Lord, if we have never done this before, come into my heart, live within me. I want to believe. I want to be a Christian. If we prayed that prayer or anything similar to it, the Lord Jesus has already begun to take up residence in our lives. And we're grateful. And then, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And we ask you to come into our lives now to refine the rough edges, to renew where we've been exhausted, to refresh where we're worn out, and to inflame where the embers have gone dry. Inflame within us your desire and your purpose and your power that we might truly rise up to be everything we were created to be for ourselves, for our family, for our church, for our community, for our state, for our world. Lord, may we not cower back from life's challenges, but instead meet with full force of holiness and fire and power your glory burning within us. Lord, we rise up now with your Holy Spirit, empowered to be your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.